Welcome back to the Everything is a Primary Source podcast, where pop culture is used to learn about history. While secondary sources, which are about a subject, are fine, primary sources, which are from a subject, are even better. Analyzing pop culture as primary sources can reveal just as much about an era in history as the thickest textbook or the longest documentary. Road Rash 2 was developed by Electronic Arts in 1992 for the Sega Genesis, the 16-bit video game platform that had itself been created to compete with the home video game giant Nintendo. Both game and system were a product of commercial outlets trying to get the attention of the teenage demographic that Nintendo and other brands were falling behind with. Brian stopped by to talk with me during my recent visit to Loaded Question Brewery in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. To speak about how games like Road Rash 2 and many other titles for the Genesis helped elevate the status of electronic arts among video gamers. I'm here with Brian at Loaded Question Brewery in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and uh, I, I brought a whole bunch of Christmas stuff because I was hoping to fill the time on my podcast between now and Christmas with Christmas-themed topics, but I brought Road Rash 2, and that's what caught your eye, isn't it? Oh, man, I love that game. I remember my Sega Genesis that I got for Christmas back in 19-something. So we could turn this into a Christmas episode, actually. I think because, we should. Uh, Genesis... What a, what a name for a, a console. It's pretty deep, actually. Genesis. Like, I mean, Nintendo already came out, and that's what it was competing against, yet they named themselves after the first book of the Bible, you know, as a way to, like, oh, yeah, video game. It was like, did you have Altered Beast? Did you have that version of it that came with Altered Beast? I don't remember what game it came with, honestly. I think I was playing... I wanted Double Dragon 2, and I wanted Rampage. So I think my parents got me the one that didn't have the game with it. Okay, and they so made you could get... So they gave me the Genesis, and I remember I was excited, but when I opened up all my presents, I was disappointed, right, because I didn't get a game. And then my dad's like, why don't you check your stocking? And I checked my stock, and I'm like, oh, dad. I was going to say, because these fit nicely into stockings, and absolutely, it's a, it, it, it started the era of deceptive gift-giving because you were like, it's not big, it's not good, but something small can be fantastic, too. Like, Game Boys are small, you know, Game Gears. Um, so, yeah, Genesis was created basically because the video game wars were on, right? Nintendo had Mario, it had all the, those colorful, bright games, but Genesis was going for that slightly older audience, right? They wanted teenagers to get into video gaming, and the best way to do that was to introduce games that would get them like, oh, this is tough, this is bad, right? I like playing right, this, right, it's absolutely. dangerous. And Road Rash, tell us a little bit about what Road Rash is all about, that oh, series. Oh, geez, Road Rash, I think, is probably the most perfect game ever invented at the time because, you know, you mentioned Mario Brothers, and I was a big Mario Kart fan. And we had the Mario Kart on the Super Nintendo, and we had some of those different racing games with Nintendo and 8-bit games growing up. Now, the cool thing about Road Rash, it was a motorcycle game, right? Yeah. But at the same time, you got to kick people and hit people right. and grab weapons and... It wasn't just about racing and being the fastest person out there. It was doing anything you had to do to win, right? If I remember correctly, like they all had names too, like the like all your enemies that you're fighting against, like Spike, and I, I forget some of the other ones, but like and some were outstanding. Like as soon as the race started, they were gone. They were. And you didn't see were. them out. And then and you also had cops to contend with. You'd be driving on on your motorcycle, and all of a sudden, you'd see lights in the back. So. The question that I chose for us to talk about is what was the maker's role or status in society? And uh, just looking at this box, what is the company name that made Road Rash 2? It says Electronic Arts. Electronic Arts, which this is their old logo, isn't it? The weird one with the, the square, the circle, and the triangle, or the cone. Um, I don't know if their status had quite made it just yet as far as being the... 
uh, the go-to for excellent games because the shape of this game and the time period it came out, 92, 91, that's right around the time of John Madden football. Absolutely. Did I you was just going to go there with you. Yep. And did, don't, do you remember this little like weird yellow plastic thing on the John Madden cartridge? Yeah, I do. You know what that's for? That's for memory. Is it? So yeah, cause, absolutely. Because that's what set it above the Nintendo, right? Is it right, exactly. So, like, when you used to play the Nintendo games, the 8-bit games, you would be able to create your players and trade players, but they'd forget, right? Right. They, they wouldn't be able to save all that. Now, they ins they had this for it. This was before, if you remember, they didn't have special packs like some of the games that came afterwards yeah. that would have the memory six. So that was actually a little battery and a memory that was in okay, there. Okay, the so that clears things up for me. I just thought it was an aesthetic thing. I thought they were like, That's oh. you don't have that on every game. Just to set it aside from, because Electronic Arts was trying new stuff with game making, weren't they? They were trying to uh, make, like, the sports games were all them because pre, like, it, the Nintendo sports games, they, they just didn't have enough power memory or anything to make them real you could only have like eight on eight football or yeah, they just went for replay value right right it, it just wasn't the same and then when john madden got brought into making video games he said no football has to be 11 on 11 you can't you know it's not football if it's not 11 on 11 so they're like all right well we got to find some way to do that but also keep costs reasonable enough that people aren't spending $200, you know, to buy a video game. So it seems like that technology carried over because Road Rash was a pretty great graphics game, wasn't it? It, it really was. It was, uh, for its time, it was great with gaff graphics. The replay was awesome. And I'm surprised that nobody's made another one since. Or may if they have, I haven't noticed. I think, it, I think they tried for other consoles. But think about the other games that were coming out late 90s, I mean, after Mortal Kombat, it was all over. You know, like, violent video games, crazy blood and guts and gore. If I remember correctly, the first couple road rashes didn't have that much. It was like guys falling off their motorcycle and that was it. But I want to say the later, like, maybe three started to introduce, like, blood, you know, because that's right. that was selling. That was, like, getting people into the arcades. That was getting them to buy the games that, you know, from... Uh, you know, the Mortal Kombats and stuff like that. And as time went on, I, I'm pretty sure they made one of these. I know they made one for Sega CD. Do you remember Sega CD? Yeah. Def was that the Dreamcast? Is that it what that was? was? It was pre-Dreamcast. It was back in the time when Sega thought it was wise to keep adding more hardware to the Genesis. Laserdisc? So, so the Sega CD came next to... It, like you would attach to the the Genesis, and then after that they came out with uh, the Sega 32 or something like that, which attached. It was like you, by the end of it, your Genesis looked the size of like your couch. It was huge, and that was like the end of the 90s. They're like people don't want gigantic entertainment systems; they want sleek. They want you know PlayStation. They want. Right, right, Xbox, which looks like a VCR size, and uh, when they, I think when they started doing Road Rash for those kind of consoles, it just got swept up in the minutia of uh, Grand Theft Auto, which has to be inspired by this game, or you know all those other ultra violent games, and this isn't going to shock anybody. But for its time, 91, 92, what is, what is uh, the status of EA Sports? What does that tell you about the time period of the early 90s? What, as far as EA Sports goes? Yeah, just and, and or just EA Electronic Arts. Um, I, I want to say they were out of Montreal. I think they were a, a East Coast company. I, I don't think they were California like so many of the other. Yeah, I, I don't really remember. The only thing I remember about EA Sports is just basically their slogan. Every time you put in a Madden or a, a RBI Baseball or a, what MVP Baseball yes, which was another uh, one. <laughs> the one with Manny Ramirez on it was a wonderful. They said EA Sports. It's in the game. Yeah. And there was, and then you knew the game was loading. You're ready to go. Let me wipe off the sweat off my hands right? with the pizza. <laughs> take a sip of that Mountain Dew. Make sure the door is locked so mom doesn't come in. It's time to rock and roll, right? The white screen with the nice clean. Oh, absolutely. I, I have a, a copy up there of one of the NBA, uh, EA Sports NBA games from around the same time period. Oh, wow. And it's funny because um, this road rash like predates that just by a hair. 
before they got known for the sports games, right. they were doing stuff like this. And I feel like there, you know, that's why it's not so highlighted on here because their status okay. hadn't arrived yet. Right, they were still kind of working out what their wheelhouse was and what the audience wanted. And when they hit that nice white packaging with the red and blue, f you know, totally different lettering than this, that's when they hooked you. And I, I, would you say their status is still pretty high when it yeah, comes to I, games? Yeah, I think so. I think so. If you th if you get a sports game and it's EA Sports, you know it's a good game. But geez, back in the '90s and the '80s, I mean, I wouldn't have even thought to think about it unless it was like Konami, right? right. And you know the code for that. <laughs> the old up, up, up down, 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 left, right, right left, left, right. BA, am I playing with somebody? Select start for the Contra code, right? And get for it. Gallagher. Um, geez, other than that, Activision, I remember that. Yeah. Capcom, yeah, Capcom had Street Fighter. And uh, I mean, there's a couple others where it's Mega like. Mega Man, right? That's Capcom. Right? Yep, there's Mega Man, Capcom, Mortal or, uh, Street Fighter uh, right, 2, right. you know, all the Street That's Fighters, right. Capcom. It, it was almost like. Um, there's this guy on, on YouTube called the Angry Video Game Nerd. Oh, really? Have you ever followed him? No. He's been around forever. He's hilarious because it's a character this guy takes on, but he's like, he has all the old video games, like, and he goes okay. after the crappy ones. And there's a particular company, the name escapes me right now, that he points out is the mark of a garbage game. Okay. Like, it's like... If this, because they had no business making video games, they were a toy company that also made video games on the side. Okay. So that's why right. they always had some fatal flaw that made it unplayable, like Fester's Quest or you know. I remember like Fester's those kind of like game, like these endless that. games that you know never go anywhere. Um, and it's the one that has like the little rainbow. You know the symbol. It's like J. I'd, I'd have to see it again, yeah. but I, I, do, I do remember something along those but lines. Like, EA was, I think, one of those companies that was breaking away from that because, I mean, this is the age of high competition for video games, right? Yes, yep. like, like we said at the beginning, like, Genesis was a great Christmas present, especially for older kids, because it was like, all right, you're getting tired of The Legend of Zelda. That's... Right. Old news. You want something with an edge. You want something kind of cool, faster, louder, more in your face. Genesis, right? That's the teenager uh, game. And this game is like, it's like MTV and all the movies of the time period, you know, just kind of like put into video game. It's fast. It's violent. It's, you know, you can win the race, but you really need to like punch out a guy to do it, <laughs> you know. Oh, right, remember exactly. when you get the chain? You're know, like whipping I, I, a chain yep, around I remember people. the chain. That's probably the first we weapon I was thinking about. This we game ruined me for like a solid decade. Every time I was on the highway and I saw a guy on a, one of the motorcycles, because <laughs> for people who never played it, it wasn't like Harley Davidson's that they were driving around. It was like street bikes, right? It was like the right, yeah, like Kawasaki's and stuff. Up and down hills. Like, I mean, it was really, yeah. It, it was kind of like um, Rad Racer, right? Yeah, that, yeah. It was just going straight forward. We're going and left and right. Yeah, and there wasn't a lot of twists and turns. And down, but you could go off the road and then recover. It yeah. wasn't like Rad Racer that you get stuck in like a hay bale or something. Right. No, you kept going. You If you got launched, you had to jam on those buttons. You had to run. Get back on that <laughs> bike, right? Jam on those buttons and go after whoever just yeah. knocked you off. And, and there was always enough computer assistance that you could always catch up to whoever. Right. And you were never out of that race. The, the, the lame guy. I think they had some guy with like, you know, lead butt or something like that. It was always the last place. And if you wow. lost to him, you were no good at the game. But this one it was like, yeah, it was, um, I mean, for a long time, I, my brother and I would played these games together. We would always rent them. We, we didn't actually own a lot of games. We would, okay. like, on the weekend get to rent some. And so we were in that much more pressure to, like, try to win the game and, like, buy more bikes. and Because right, right. we're like, oh, we only have two days to do this, so we, go, we better get on it. Oh and man, that's another topic. I mean, just remembering renting, I just miss that. And when we were talking about this earlier, I remember going to the local video store and just renting. I was able to pay whatever it was, $10 for an hour and just go house on whatever video games they had. And yeah. just keep going and keep going and keep it going. Was, it, was a, it was definitely an era that you can see a beginning and end to because I would say probably when the last blockbuster closed, right. that was the end of the era. And that was, and actually 
When I was a kid, right across the street from where we're sitting right now, uh, I think there's a pizza place there now. Right around the corner from Hannaford was the video store that we used to go to. Okay. And they, you know, it was the, the classic video store with the the little, um, you know, you take the tag off the the rack yeah, and you bring okay. it to the counter and they'd give you the actual tape and and stuff like that and places like that is where we'd always get our games too because they go hand in hand i remember re having to return these games and my mom you know generation obviously hopefully older than us uh said the sweetest thing one time she's like do you have to rewind your games <laughs> yeah, and we're like that. no oh mom goodness. you know like the, the tapes you have to rewind those but the the games they just start from the beginning. Yeah, you just have to blow on the games. Right, it's a whole That's different situation. You, you got to oh. blow on it. There was, we were not experts in that. So many games. Nintendo was worse than Sega when it came to that. But yeah, the, you'd put it in. Come on, it's not working. You get the scrambled screen. Right, right. Blow on it. You but know? at least with Nintendo, you had that option to stick that other game on top of the first game. Right. And get a connection that and way. And see if it would work out. I was always worried that like. So before I blew on the game, I made sure that my mouth was as dry as possible because <laughs> I was really afraid I was going to spit on it and then it would, like, War electrocute worse, me. Right? <laughs> because it's just like a little microchip underneath it, right? Yeah. So this is a sizable one, but, you know, talking about the 8-bit Nintendo, this is 16-bit, this Road Rage. These things have kind of had a renaissance in recent years because of all those um, retro games that they're coming back out with. Okay. And, I mean, more recently, they just have it like you don't need a cartridge, but you know, you just say they, they. It looks like a little Nintendo, and has like 400 games on there. Oh uh, right, you I know, have that, but the core's not long enough. Right, exactly, and they and <laughs> you can't just use the old. But they for a while, probably about 10 years ago, they were making these things called twins, and it was like a Sega Genesis and a Super Nintendo all in one, and okay. it, the cartridges would work for that, and it was totally marketed towards our age group because exactly. it was like you pro your, your own machine probably is ruined now or you got rid of it but it, it brought these games right back again because suddenly pawn shops and you know a lot of like video game stores and other media stores were selling the old games again and i remember i would go to like flea markets and and uh oh, yard the flea sales markets. And look i for remember them doing that yeah the flea but market. then Ten dollar games. Right, I well bought up all the Nintendo games when Genesis and Super Nintendo came up. I remember just going with like twenty bucks and just we used to stack them. I had one probably four feet tall, just one on top of another, just taller than me at the time. It was, and that's. I think I had all the games at one point. It was such a cool way to, especially the sports games, to interact with the game. You know, Road Rash, not as much, but. You know, because thank God it's not real. Um, but the the like the Madden, and I'm <laughs> I remember it was like another parent story. I remember playing the original Madden, and my dad was watching. He was like, "That looks like real TV." <laughs> yeah, and of right. course, you know, for the time it was really great. But looking back on the original Madden now, it's like, oh my God, that looks real to you, Dad? Because it, you know, I could yeah, show you. Absolutely. Like I have a game. I play Madden on my phone now, and that looks real. Like right, that's right. solid. Um, you know, it's funny, EA Sports, we were talking about that and just the effect they had on our childhood. I have an Xbox One. I know it's an older system, but I just bought two new games. Yeah. And they were both EA Sport games. I bought Madden, and if you've ever played Madden, it plays the same way. It has yeah. to replay that all the buttons on the left go to the left receiver, the ones on the right go to the right receiver. And I bought Tiger Woods. The new Tiger Woods came out. That's been gone for, you know, quite some time now, right? Yeah. But that's an EA Sports game, and I have the new Tiger Woods. But it's different now because now I'm used to watching TV and playing games on my phone. So now when I put the games on my Xbox, I want to play with my phone. And I can't – it's just a different way of yeah. playing games these days, right? It is It is a weird – it's a much different relationship. But it's like it's gone full circle almost because the portability aspect of games was the – I think like the first hurdle that we had to get past because like for a long time the arcade was the only place to play it but then you could bring it home but that it was kind of portable like you could unplug it with ease and go somewhere else like in that movie The Wizard uh, oh yeah Fred Savage is it, Chris, it Christian Slater's character 
like brings his Nintendo everywhere he goes. And oh, that the, the best part about that that was the first time we saw Super Mario Brothers three. Do you remember? That's right. That? They used it as a marketing and campaign. And he figured out how to do stand on top of a white box for eight seconds and dis. He was able to sneak behind the background yes. to get the whistle to the warp zone, and all the '80s kids went wild when that happened. What I that drove me nuts in that movie because I'm like. The girl is like telling how to, d- like, she's yelling from the crowd. Like, d- I'm like, how did you know the game just came out a minute ago? How would you know how to do anything? Well, I mean, to he get was to a wizard after that's all. That's right. Wasn't he it? figured it out because he's brilliant. Did you see that glove they were playing with yeah. at one time? I never got to play with that. The, I think I remember Must be nice. that's all a I have friend to say. of mine's house. He had it, but he gave up on it pretty quick because it was like, it didn't work. But the kid in that movie was like, I n- he, he says something. He's like, I never leave home without it. Yeah. And I, that was actually Tobey Maguire's first movie. No kidding. He's in the background. I'm have to revisit this. He's now. one of the kid with the glove. He's one of his like lackeys, and, it's, and he's like sitting in the background. There's Spider Man, just like, mm, you know. And it's like, and then like, um, man, you just brought up a whole like Mandela effect thing too. That for the longest oh, yeah. time I thought that was Ben Savage that played the wizard, like Fred Savage's little brother. It's totally not. I watched the movie last year. Right. That's not him. I thought it was the Boy Meets World kid. It's not. No, no, that's his older brother. Yeah, like that's Fred in the movie. That's but Fred, who but the little kid with. in the movie is not Ben Savage at all. It's some right. totally other kid. I thought it was him. Uh, I could remember curly hair, but it, w- it didn't have curly hair. Um, and then Super Mario Brothers 3, last thought before we wrap things up with Road Rash, is I've heard speculation that that's actually a play put on by the Mario characters about the first two games. Okay, okay. Because it starts out with curtains All right, with the curtains. Come up, and then all of the, the levels almost look like sets. That's why you can, like, go behind, right, okay, you know, the blocks. Sense. Like, they're, like, actually like a painted set of, like, the original game. That was one of my favorite games because it wasn't just left to right. You could go right to yeah. left. And then you could fly. You could get that, that raccoon tail, and you could fly and, and go above everything. I want to say it was that game that put the challenge out there to the other video game developers. You know, not just the Nintendo itself, but specifically that game. Because that, w- that game came out, I think, 89, 88, 89 or so. And then okay. if you were already on to the sequel... To Road Rash by 91, 92. Okay. This says there's an explosion, 80s into the 90s, of video games coming out from all directions, all different topics. It's a far cry from Mario. There's no raccoon tails in this. It certainly is. You know. So, Brian, thank you so much for oh, coming back welcome. here and this talking to me. Talking about the old days. About Road Rash 2. Long ago. Awesome. We're just a little past halfway through Season 2 of the Everything is a Primary Source podcast. I hope you've enjoyed listening to what you've heard so far. Short episodes like this one, which are products of my EPS podcast live exhibits, have been coming out on Tuesdays this season, while longer episodes, deeper dives into subjects, are posted on Thursdays. If you like what you hear, consider becoming a patron by going to patreon.com slash EPS podcast. Follow the show on social media, including YouTube and especially Instagram. I look forward to you tuning in again to the EPS podcast, where everything is a primary source.